So I'm here on behalf of the Creative Industries Federation, which is actually a fairly new organisation. We've been up and running uh, for just two years and two weeks. Um, there is nothing quite like us, we don't think, anywhere in the world. And we were the brainchild of Sir John Sorrell, who is a UK designer, a UK business ambassador, um, and also a philanthropist. Um, for a number of years, he had been deeply concerned about the fact that whilst there were lots and lots of incredibly effective single sector bodies working on behalf of the UK's arts, creative industries and cultural education. There was no one organisation who could really fight on behalf of the sector of the whole, as a whole. And the feeling was that quite a lot of the messages of the sector as a result were getting lost um, as, as in the central government policy making perspective. So he came together with a number of, of UK industry leaders um, about two and a half years ago, including Nick Sorota from the Tate, uh, Tony Hall, who's Director General of the BBC, Martha Lane Fox, um, uh, Peter Basil Jack from the Arts Council, and a number of other leading lights across the sector to bring together what is now the Creative Industries Federation. So we launched about two years ago. And we now have a thousand members, and importantly, our members come from every single sector of the arts and creative industries, but also from cultural education. And there's a very strong feeling that those are the three legs of the stool. And if there are any policy interventions that worry one of those legs, all three will suffer. Or if there isn't the right policy infrastructure for those three legs, all one, they will all suffer. Um, so how we work on policy, because it was obviously a very broad canvas, is we only campaign on issues which pertain to all of our members. So we focus very, very much on talent and skills and the skills pipeline. We focus on infrastructure um, for the sector. We focus on access to finance and funding. And we focus on what the international position of the UK's arts and creative industries is and what support is needed. Now, those were the four policy areas we were focusing on. We've obviously, on the 24th of June, we added Brexit and the implications of Brexit on the UK's arts and creative industries. Um, but the work didn't just start on the 24th of June. We actually started far earlier in February, just after David Cameron came back from Brussels. Um, at that point, we sent a survey out to our thousand members um, and we didn't just ask, are you thinking of remain or leave? We actually asked a series of really detailed questions and thought it was a fantastic opportunity for us to really understand what is the nature of the sector's relationship with Europe and why does it matter so much? So the results of our survey is quite well known that 96% of our members did vote or said that they were going to vote um, to remain in the EU. But actually what was probably more interesting is the amount of detail we got about the relationship. And again, it fell into four very obvious categories, which was I mean, freedom of movement, access to talent and skills. What that means was absolutely categorically the most important. Um, and I mean, across every sector, whether you're in advertising or whether you're in an orchestra or whether you're in cultural education, I mean, everybody, that was their absolute number one concern. Um, trade, the EU being an incredibly easy trading partner, obviously was very, very important. A lot of our members are very invested in copyright, IP, trademark protection, and the influence we've had there has been important. And then also, for an awful lot of people, it was funding um, was the issue as well, and access to the various funding streams. So when it came to the 24th of June, we were pretty well prepared, actually, in terms of knowing what the implications potentially were. And we were quick out of the blocks that morning, and, and by 11 o'clock, our very enthusiastic chief executive had agreed and announced that we would do 11 roadshows around the UK to go and visit uh, members of the arts um, and well, the entire community. Um, we kicked off in London with a meeting of 200 industry leaders a week after the referendum and then over the course of the summer we visited uh, 10 cities from Plymouth to Newcastle, Edinburgh, um, Swansea, Cardiff, Bristol, pretty much covered the whole country. Um, and at the end of that, that culminated in a pretty lengthy report which we can circulate to you um, if, if you'd be interested. It really gives a very good and detailed snapshot of, of, say, what the relationship of the sector is, where the pressure points are, where the red lines are um, in negotiations. And we presented it to the Secretary of State, Karen Bradley, at the end of October. And subsequently, we've been into eight government departments now to speak about various 
bits and pieces of it. And I think what we can do as an organisation which is incredibly important is by being able to summarise this and put it in front of whether it's the Department for Exiting the EU, or we're speaking to Number 10, or we're speaking to Treasury, we're able to do this in a way that means we cannot be ignored as a sector. And actually, when it comes to negotiations, we very much hope that we won't be forgotten. You know, the financial services have vast, enormous, obviously, sums of money and negotiating power, um, and that we hope that by being able to speak with one voice on such an important issue, it will help. Um, I'll just give you a tiny bit of detail on, on the sort of things which I think might be of interest that came out of the report. I mean, in terms of talents and skills, I mean, we are an incredibly diverse workforce in the UK, and we benefit enormously from the fact that we have a huge number of European nationals working in the UK, but also the fact that our UK nationals can come, obviously, and work so easily in Europe. I mean, officially, the UK statistic is it's only 6% of the creative industry's workforce is European, but we absolutely categorically do not think that is the case. I mean, certainly in London, we were hearing up to sometimes 50% of um, some of the creative industries companies with European workforce. And that's not just about plugging skills gaps, because a lot of, lot of the creative industries have global skills shortages. There are not enough animators in the world. There are not enough visual effects professionals in the world. Now, in the UK, we happen to have some incredibly good tax systems, which means we make lots and lots of films and animation. So we do attract a lot of EU nationals. But actually, a lot of people also just love working in, in London. Um, so that's, I mean, it's interesting, the sort of creative hub um, that we have there, and that people can come and go um, as they wish. Another issue is the freelancing came up time and time again, because we are a sector who has so many self-employed and freelancers. And whether you're a violinist or work in visual effects or whether you are working on a film, the fact that you can move backwards and forwards is incredibly valuable to our sector. And there's no sort of automatic, sort of obvious visa system that could be put into place. So that's something that we would very much uh, like to work on is, is some sort of freelance visa or self-employed visa, um, both in, in a reciprocal way. Um, our universities, again, obviously, we have, particularly in the arts world, we have a very huge, high number of, of international students. And I mean, University of the Arts London has estimated if EU students had to move on to international students' fees, they would see their fees go up by 91% overnight. So there is a huge barrier, essentially, if you know, to accessing to some, again, some of these incredible art schools uh, that we have in, in the UK. Um, and we say we welcome enormously the diversity, uh, the importance of the diversity that bringing in EU students into our universities brings. Um, also, obviously, EU funding. Some of the examples we had when we went around the UK of just how interesting the collaborative nature of EU funding has been and how important it has been. I mean, the Creative Europe programme came up time and time again. It's just an incredibly powerful example of, of how networks can be formed across Europe. Um, international trade, I mean, you know, it's all very well to say there are lots of markets that we haven't traded with, but if you are a tiny business, and most arts and creative industries are tiny businesses, the average number of employees <clears throat> in England is just 3.3 employees per business in the creative industries, you're not going to have the time or resources to go and seek out new markets in India, Australia, all the markets that have been cited as fantastic new opportunities. I mean, Europe has been such a fantastic trading partner um, on the doorstep for particularly small businesses to start their export journey. Um, and then obviously digital single market and IP is huge. Um, and our influence there, I think, has, has helped a lot of um, other European countries in terms of making sure there is a strong copyright and IP framework. Um, and we very much urge that that we continue to have a seat at the negotiating table. So we hope that what we've done in, in putting together this report is incredibly practical. We've not been dramatic about it, but nor have we been overly optimistic and ignored the hurdles that we're going to have um, ahead of us. And I think our role is really to continue to be incredibly practical, to continue to gather evidence of where issues that have been mooted have actually turned into real issues or where solutions have been found um, and to continue to engage with government on a, a very, very active 
basis just to ensure that for everybody, both here and in Europe, we have the best possible outcome of the forthcoming negotiations. Thank you. That's great to hear that, that Harriet. And I are, are you starting to get response from the various government departments that you're, whose corridors you're yeah, trading I'm, I'm around? Always, I'm, I'm always asked that. We, uh, we, I mean, we, the thing that I would say, which I think is amazing, is the door is wide open. I mean, there is no problem in engaging at all. There is very, very, very little feedback. But we feel very, very delighted that actually, as a sector, we are being listened to at the highest level. And I think that's important. I have a direct question to this. I read in The Guardian that uh, the cultural minister is not involved in some kind of Brexit board of ministers negotiating mm. and preparing. Is this true? It, it is true. Yes, no, it is true. I mean, we, we, which is why we don't just engage with DCMS, it's so with, which is the Department of Culture um, in the UK. We engage across every single department. Um, I mean, they have worked closely together. And when we presented, formally presented our document to government, it was both the Secretary of State for Culture and the Minister from Departmenting, Department for Exiting the EU were both there at the same time. Um, also, just quickly, they, there is going to be an announcement, maybe this side of Christmas, on industrial strategy, which is another priority of the Prime Minister in, her, in the new administration in the UK. To date, the Creative Industries has not had a named place within it. There is a feeling we may have a named place. And actually, if we do, that's an extraordinarily important step to be able to influence those negotiations as well. Thank you.